It is only a small part of social media, but I think it's a huge part of their potential for sustainability and marketing, which is in the other meaning of the word media. A medium is like clay, something plastic which you can form. And the, the media are one example of human culture. And human beings are cultured, a cultured species, like beavers. We make some of our habitat. We make some of the human habitat. This is apparent in industrial design when you walk up a street and so forth. We've made parts of the habitat. And these social media are extraordinarily plastic ways of creating new traditions, customs, ways of interacting. They're, they're one example of places where you can do sustainability together. There's lots of other places. Transition towns have shown that you can do it just by sort of sharing uh, back gardens as orchards and, and so forth. But um, and so this is the theory of the social media. There's a really good book by Clay Shirky called Here Comes Everybody that's all about the power of self-organisation. And this was the key insight, actually, the best use of social media for anything to do with politics was the Obama election. And there's been many, many different explanations of why this was good. The person who ran this, uh, a guy called Chris Hughes, who was ex-Facebook uh, and worked on this team, said that the, the simple difference in how they use social media, basically the neocons in particular had been using blog and leaving comments and blasting messages out there, you know, for, for some considerable time. Where this was a complete departure was that it allowed the people to organise their own campaign. What one in seven American voters actually took part in the Obama campaign. Now that could be as simple as forwarding emails and messages. There was an iPhone map, uh, app where you could choose people from your phone book to phone and canvas based on which swing states they were in and so forth. But it basically got people making the campaign themselves and it started with one of the things I'll talk about which was fundraising where um, half the money for this campaign was raised in units of less than $50 and so forth and it created this momentum which yes we can, that was the summation of it but it wasn't empty rhetoric, a lot of people felt that they were making a political phenomenon. That's the type of social media that I'm interested in. As I say there's a lot of stuff uh, that doesn't fall into that which is to do with sitting between people on the bus uh, but I'm just less interested in that and I think it's less application for sustainability so uh, this is a group in Britain who do a, uh, you'll remember this case study from the, um, the Observer Ethical Awards uh, judging and stuff, but these people do what are called Twitter storms and they just get a whole load of people to go and do things. This is stuff that Dave's been doing, I, I get lots of emails from Dave's campaigns, Age of Stupid and so forth, getting a load of us out to do something together. I'll talk about some of these tactics. So this has been great stuff for making campaigns and often like these people with very little resources, just to, you know, having the ability to tap into some celebrities and others to forward things is, is one key uh, Twitter resource and you can't buy that despite uh, uh, sorry to all the people in uh, PR here uh, who may think that you can and there are ways of buying access of course as well but small print, uh, your experience may vary um, Pepsi Refresh, this is um, I love this just as a sort of big iconic thing, I have arguments with sustainability people because this is pumping uh, people with yet more sugar drinks and so forth but what they did is they took literally their Super Bowl budget which was the absolute epitome of interruption marketing. You're right in the middle of the game. And American sports have been designed around that introduction, uh, interruption, the need to have long breaks where the ads can sit, which cost gazillions. Um, and what they did is they took the Super Bowl budget and intent, instead turned it into this massive pop idol for local causes and charities in units from 500 up to uh, $50,000 and got everybody to vote on what they, uh, what they wanted the money to go to. And this was a social media phenomenon. There was one thing going around a month ago saying they'd managed to get 30 million active people involved in this. It took Facebook at nearly two years to get 80 million people. That's incredible in terms of the return on their investment. If you were just measuring how, pe how many people had an interesting thought about Pepsi this month, it would be uh, incredible, an old sort of advertising metric. And it's done a lot of good. It's funneled a lot of Pepsi's money that would have gone into other things into local causes and charities. And it's very much tapping into, it was sort of Obama too, it was very much tapping into a particular mood and time social media. So I have um, a very quick, because all of these will be sort of familiar, I have a very quick stumble through what I think are some of the key tactics when you're doing sustainability together uh, with people. Uh, they are, number one, social production. Uh, social production is basically Wikipedia. It's when uh, the, the, the audience build something together. They build the Beaver's Dam. Uh, this isn't particularly a sustainability example. This was NASA who got people to survey Mars in a way that they couldn't afford with their own resources by doing um, uh, just little green rings with their mouse and 
uh, there's a professor uh, in Sussex University that's trying to get people to log which way bees waggle dancers are pointing. And my son and I took part in a spider hunt. I, mean, I really like these citizen science projects. But the social production is also the world of Amazon reviews, where people just make information available to each other, content production, so forth. Uh, crowdfunding, number two, uh, The Age of Stupid, funded to the tune, I think, um, you'll correct me if I got this wrong, 450,000, including the money for the launch, uh, from people's uh, basically donations. If you donated a very large amount, you could become a shareholder in the film if it became profitable, I think over 5,000. But basically, a lot of people just wanted to give some money. And there's a, a site called uh, Kickstarter where people put up much smaller creative projects. I'd just like to make this T-shirt because I think it's cool, or I'd like to put on this theatre in my this, this show in my local theatre, and would like people like to donate some money, and maybe you get something back. Maybe I'll give some tickets or some T-shirts and so forth. And it's been really successful. People just seem to have the goodwill. They want to support creative projects and feel like they put their name on that little uh, piece of human culture. Resource sharing. Uh, you know, this is the one I put on my blog last night. There's lots of examples of this. This is basically where you can rent your neighbour's car. Um, now, I'm not sure I can do this looking at the carbon footprints of some of the things uh, I see parked in my street. They can, they're welcome to rent my Prius, though, because um, it hardly get, ever gets used. And actually, Rob would take me apart on the carbon impact of owning a pr uh, Prius that isn't used. Uh, uh, but that's one of many examples. I'm, I'm, I'm very into this kind of model. I call it the laundrette model, but the, the idea that just by having networks of shared resource, there's a great successful dot com in the States where people rent handbags instead of buying them. There, there are lots of things in life where we can get the need and the benefit out of them and have a relationship with a company that provides them without having to use one, hardly ever use it, then throw it away. And I think shared resource is going to be a key theme in developing new business models as well as beyond uh, just using media. Biopower, uh, many examples of this. I really like Carrot Mob. I really like this because I, I call it, uh, in fact, I think it was Nigel that uh, the design council gave me this term, but um, uh, joy cotting, which the idea is instead of slamming, Greenpeace slams Apple and alienates you know, all the people who own apples and other stuff, which they had done consistently for a number of years because Greenpeace were the bottom of their electronic survey. Uh, instead, they did a, a really nice campaign working with, animal, uh, with uh, Apple fans called Green My Apple, and people made web websites and films and you know, uh, personal message to Steve Jobs and then he came out and announced that he would do it because he cared about the mood and uh, so forth of uh, the Apple fans and they've done things that they're asked to like take well they've committed to a time to take PVC out of their cables I think. Um, missions. Uh, this is a brilliant thing. Just go and check it out. I haven't got, uh, I'd need half an hour to do this, um, any kind of justice. This is Urgent Evoke. Uh, this is Sarah, who you can find on the TED site. If you Google TED, say, uh, TED Sarah Social Games, uh, McDonagall, I think. And I was introduced to this by a friend of mine who's really into alternate reality games. And he went, there's this really cool game, and you'll like it because it's about sustainability, funded by the World Bank. And it was all about identifying and developing social entrepreneurs but it's a social game. Go and check it out. They have to go and do missions. They have to go and do something, for instance, to empower women in Africa. And there's a range of things they can do. They collect points, and six of them went to Washington with the World Bank. As, and anybody who took part got a certificate saying, I'm a certified social entrepreneur. Uh, but it's a brilliant game, and it also had a social purpose. Uh, the last one that was that good, I think, was World Without Oil, another brilliant. Uh, I think there's a general insight that sustainability makes terrible movies and, and, and brilliant... Uh, um, internet games. Uh, I don't know why. Somebody can explain that to me. Uh, trust networks. Uh, this is the Woofy Bank, which basically ranks you as a Twitter user on how much you're retweeted. So one of the top people on this, I think, is uh, what's his name? Uh, Deepak Chopra is one of the top people at Woofy Bank because he's a guru. When he speaks, everybody in his uh, networks uh, re repeats what he says, um, and so he has a very high trust rating. It's a rather simple metric, and slightly disappointing when you find. But it's a way of ranking people on trust and there are all sorts of people looking at what's going to be the equivalent of a credit scoring and things, you know, leading on from things like the eBay uh, feedback, but how can I can carry one of those around as a, a social network and even a credit rating. Um, transparency, uh, again, huge. Uh, good guides, uh, you can now scan, uh, I think, for instance, 5,000 toys out of 50,000 that have been tested. You'll be told that the 5,000 are approved by good guide as safe for children, sustainable, and so forth. This is in America and the great thing is obviously interrupting shopping by being able to scan it. Other people are launching services where they just sim simply say that it was also cheaper up the road. Um, but the really big news in this area has been the Walmart index, just 